Welcome to You Flourish Church. Uh, my name is Kurt. I serve as one of the pastors here at You Flourish Church. We are excited to have so many wonderful faces in the building on today. I am just been riding on an emotional high the past couple of weeks, just seeing all that God is doing, and I'm just excited that I have opportunity to be a part of that. Uh, uh, you know, as I was putting this uh, sermon together this week, I began to think back uh, to uh, Dee Dee and I's marriage. Uh, you know, when we first got married, we did a lot of arguing and fussing. I don't know if anybody know about that. But, but we did a lot of arguing and fussing, and sometimes we hit below the belt. I don't know if anybody know about that, but we used to hit below the belt. And, and so I was a college dropout at the time. Dee Dee was a high school dropout. And so every time we got into an argument, she would always say, you so stupid. And I, I just hated that so much. I just hated being called stupid so much. And one time she said, you so stupid. And, and, and Dee Dee, at the at point in time, she was trying to get her GED, but she kept failing all of her GED tests. And I'm like, I'm stupid. You're the one that can't pass the GED test. And, and, and what, what ended up happening is that just drove her. That did something to her. I don't know what that did to her, but it did, did, did something to her. And, and, and probably about that six or seven times, she passed that GED test, and she went straight to nursing school. And she didn't stop. She just kept going, and she kept going. And, and I went back to college as well, but, you know, I just, yeah, you know, I don't know. I was on a lifetime program. <laughs> but, but Dee Dee, she, she, she finished college before me. And then when we got into it again, she's like, well, you don't want to have been in college all your life. I didn't even finish high school and I didn't got done before you. <laughs> Subsequently, the words I said that day, it cut so deeply to the heart that she gave an unwavering devotion to completing her education. In much the same way in today's passage, we're going to learn about a group in Jerusalem who were cut to the heart so deeply that they gave an unwavering devotion to fulfilling the Great Commission. There's just three points that we're going to see in our passage today as we pick up. Is, and, the, and the three points that we're going to see in our passage today is that the church devoted themselves to discipleship. That the church devoted themselves to equity. And that the church devoted themselves to one another. And so if you're uh, uh, following along this morning, we're going to start by unpacking that, that first point is, is that the church devoted themselves to discipleship. If your Bibles are open, we're going to be picking up today in Acts 2, uh, beginning in the 41st verse. But before we go there, may we go to the Lord in prayer. Um, God, you are good. We love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, your love, your kindness. God, I pray above all that you would speak. God, I pray that you will anoint, anoint our ears to hear everything that you speak. And God, I pray that you will anoint our hearts to apply all that you speak. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And, and so picking up in, in, in verse uh, 41 of Acts 2, this is what it says. It says, so those who received his word were baptized, and, and, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. If you're following along, I want to bring to your attention in verse 20, uh, 42, I'm sorry. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. And, and so here... Uh, what we see is this is a transition uh, from the day of Pentecost that we talked about uh, last week of the establishment of a believer's community. And, and I want you to remember what happened on the day of Pentecost is, as Jesus had told uh, his disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait, and he was going to send them something. And, and that something transpired on the day of Pentecost. Said the Holy Spirit took over and it filled all 120 of them and there was a uh, uh, devout man from every nation under heaven every, every nation so, so there was a diverse community uh, that, that, that ended up coming to Jerusalem at this point in time for, for Pentecost and so everybody from every people group the word says was there and what began to happen, it says, as the Spirit began to fill the entire 120, it says they began to start speaking in the tongues of every nation of the people that was there. So the people that was there, 
They heard their language being spoken. The Asians, they heard their language being spoken. The Africans, they heard their language being spoken. The Indians, they heard their language being spoken. The Arabi- Arabians, they heard their language being spoken. Everybody heard their language being spoken. And then we find out that on that day, they wanted to find out what was going on. They asked Peter, what must we do to be saved? What must we do? And Peter, he told them, he says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ. And he says, you will receive the Holy Spirit. And so what we find is that day, 3,000 multi-ethnic people from every nation under the earth believed and received. And so, and so, so now here we are at, at this place. It says it's, it's about 3,000 were, were baptized. And, and, and so, so subsequently what we see is the first church, they devoted themselves to fulfilling the Great Commission. What do I mean? Uh, well, we have to look no further than Matthew 28 and 19 and what Jesus told them. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. And he says, in teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And all of a sudden, what we see is the first church doing this very thing. What we see is that they're, they're baptizing. Uh, we, we, we see this. He says, go into every nation. When we talk about every nation, we're not talking about geography. What we're talking about is people groups. I think it's, un- it's really important to understand this because sometimes when we talk about trying to establish a multi-ethnic church, sometimes people think that we're doing something new. This is not new. This is not something that's cute. This is not something that's fancy. This is what happened at the beginning. The church was established with the multi-ethnic church. And so let's not get it twisted. We're not doing anything cute. We're just going back to where we came from. It, it, it started, and so Jesus, his commandment was, I want you to go to every nation. I want you to go to every people group. Don't leave anybody out. And he says, I want you to make disciples of them. And he says, I want you to baptize. And so what we see that's happening right here at this very moment is they're fulfilling the Great Commission. Uh, uh, and, 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 and so in verse 41, the Great Commission to baptize was fulfilled. It says, as all who received the word were baptized, up through verse 41, we see two of the three elements of the Great Commission being fulfilled. However, as we transition to verse 42, we see the third element of the Great Commission being fulfilled. One, he says, go into all the nations. Two, he says, to baptize. The third one is teach. Jesus says, I want you to teach everything that I have commanded. And and, and in verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is the third element of the Great Commission. And, And let me just say this. What we see here is the power of obedience. I I, 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 want to direct your attention because Jesus, he gives instructions on discipleship in Matthew 28. And here we see the apostles walking in obedience to what Jesus instructed. He says, I want you to teach them everything that I've commanded you. And how important is it that that we grasp that teaching given today? Because we can teach a whole lot of things. We can teach everything that our denomination has taught us. We can teach everything that we grew up in. We can teach everything that, 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 we, that we think and, and put rules up and regulations up. But Jesus says, I want you to teach everything that I have commanded you. And so subsequently, we see 3,000 multi-ethnic people devoting themselves to the act of the apostles' obedience. And I say the act of their obedience is because they're teaching exactly what Jesus asked them to teach. They're they're teaching exactly what what, what it was that, that Jesus commanded. In other words, the apostles' level of influence was directly connected to their level of obedience. What would it look like, ladies and gentlemen, if our level of influence was connected to our level of obedience. How much influence would we have? And I'm not talking about the ability to influence this, and that, but I'm talking about influence for the kingdom of God. How much influence for the kingdom of God do we walk around with each and every day? 
When we go to work, how much influence of the kingdom of God do we have when we go to work, when we, when we in our relationships, how much influence of the kingdom of God do we have? And so what we see, the, the, the people were devoted to the apostles' teaching because the apostles were walking in obedience to what Jesus commanded them to teach. It wasn't that they were just amazing teachers. They're simply walking in obedience. You know, it's a beautiful thing when you don't have to think of some amazing sermon to put together when you just simply are living out your faith. When you can begin to speak out of a place of living out my faith, you don't have to dream up of a good saying. You don't have to dream up a good sermon on Saturday night. You can just tell people how it is that I'm living out my faith. And, and this is where the influence is at, and the influence is so powerful that it says that 3,000 people, it says they devoted themselves to the teaching. What would our lives look like when we can devote ourselves to what Jesus taught? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that we can change our city when we can devote ourselves to what it is that Jesus taught. In obedience, in obedience, they teach everything Jesus commanded. And again, we find these 3,000 people. And I'm of the belief that, that teaching, it extends beyond just words. I think teaching, it springs out of a life that's lived out. You know, I was listening to my grandson. He said a cuss word the other day. And I'm like, huh? Where, where, where did that come from? My daughter's like, I don't know where he got that from. I say, I, I can uh, assure you that I know where he got it from. He got it from you. And you didn't have to teach him and say, son, I want you to cuss. No, because he hears it in your language, that's the language that he's learned. That's the language that you're teaching him. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's not just about what comes out of our mouth. It's about a life that's lived out. In every way and every which way that we live out our life, somebody is watching. Somebody is watching. And, 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 and so what we find that here is that I, I want you to understand that when it comes to, to living out our faith, the only way that we can begin to impact the spaces and places that we occupy is that we actually live out what it is that we say that we believe. And I remember like, I, you know, I, y'all, y- some of y'all that know me, y'all know I, I, I love everything gangster. I like gangster movies. I like... I like when Jesus say gangster stuff, like when he came in, he turned the tables over and started whooping everybody. I'm like, man, that's gangster. I, I, I just love gangster stuff. And, 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 and there was a point in time in my life where, you know, I hung, I hung out with gangsters. I hung out with gangsters who were willing to do things that maybe I really wasn't willing to do. And that's when I realized, like, man, I, 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 probably, I probably ain't about that life. And I, and I remember there was a point in time we got into a fight with somebody at the club and, and all of our guys, we got together and we dressed in black and put on army fatigue and painted our faces up and had every gun named to, named to, known to man. And we went and we sat on the train tracks waiting on this guy at the club to come out because we was going to kill this guy as he came out the club. And I remember sitting there laying there and I'm thinking to myself, Kurt, what are you doing? What are you doing? And, and the, the spirit began to just deal with me at that moment. And all of a sudden, none of everybody, nobody knew, but I started praying. I was like, God, please don't let that man be in that club tonight. God, please don't let him be. God, I don't want to kill anybody. God, and I know some of these 20 people, they're going to tell. And I just got to praying that, the, and, 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 and God somehow answered my prayer because that night that guy wasn't there. And I promised myself like, man, I ain't about this life. I wasn't willing to live out a gangster life. And so it's just something about when we say that we believe in what we believe in, are we willing to allow ourselves to die for it? Well, I was willing to die for some stupid stuff until God woke me up. I'm like, God, for you I'll live and for you I'll die. And ladies and gentlemen, I think God is calling the people right now today to stand up for everything it is that he teaches. Subsequently, verse 42, it provides us a perfect model of a discipleship plan. While teaching, it was a key element 
The discipleship in verse 42, it also includes fellowship. And this is very, very important. Fellowship is very, very important. And so what I often teach here at You Flourish Church is that you invite people into your life before you ever invite them to your church. You, and let me, let me just say this, because oftentimes we invite people to church to meet Jesus. But if Jesus lives in you, invite them into your life so they can meet Jesus. That, that, that's the challenge. And, and so my hope is by the time that you invite people here, you've invited them into your life. And so what we see in this discipleship plan is that they're in fellowship. They're breaking bread in their homes. They're, they're, and, you know, today, we, they, I don't know if they had coffee back then. So we had to substitute coffee for breaking bread. But, 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 but I, I, I've always said I, I, my desire is that we drink more coffee at this church than any church in the world. history of churches. It's because we're listening to one another's story. We're sitting down and we're taking interest in the next person. How hard would it be to just invite somebody into your life? How hard would it be to just listen to somebody's story? Ladies and gentlemen, this is discipleship. And, and, and this is before you ever need to get to a place and like, well, you know, I don't know the Bible that good. Well, this doesn't require you to know the Bible that good. Jesus lives in you. Just let them get out the way and let them meet the Jesus that lives inside of you. You don't got to have a biblical conversation. Just take an interest in the next person. So fellowship was really, really important. And this is why the church is growing and they're moving. It says, and the prayers. So they're breaking bread. And in verse 43, it says, all came upon everyone and many wonders and signs was being done through the apostles. Some amazing things is happening in this first church. Some amazing things is happening. And how do we get to a place where we can just duplicate the very thing that the church was established on? So not only do we find that the church devoted themselves to discipleship, the second point in this passage is that we find the church devoted themselves to equity. Let's pick up in verse 44, look at what it says. It says, and all who believed were together, say together, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Uh, I, I, I want to stop there and bring to your attention in verse 45 and have you to highlight they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds. Now, now here what we see, uh, the first church, they're not only diverse in ethnicity, but they're also pretty diverse economically. And, and, and yet the work of Jesus, it was so strong. It was so strong that they were compelled to meet each other's needs. Let me just say, before I go too far, let me address the elephant in the room. Because many Christians in America will read this passage and immediately begin to start defending capitalism. So, so let me say this. I'm not here to defend or dispute an economic system. I preach the gospel. And, and, and this passage is simply about a body of believers who voluntarily give up their stuff to meet the needs of others. Nobody had to take it from them and redistrib redistribute the wealth. Nobody took it. No, something that was happening in their midst compelled them to say, I want to meet the needs of my brother. Like, like I, I love my brother and my sister so much that I want to meet the needs of my brother. So they voluntarily did it. And so let me just say, this is not about capitalism. It's not about socialism. It's not about communism. It's about gospelism. This is a whole nother, whole nother economic system for the believers. Gospelism was happening. And, and, and this is what it looked like when a community of believers devote themselves to living out the gospel. It was a willingness to give up some of my comforts to meet the needs of my brothers and my sisters. And, 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 uh, it, you know, this, this, is, this is a tough one. This, this is a, a pretty tough passage for, for people to be able to wrap their minds around. But, but let me just tell you, it was something about Jesus that was happening among this group that was so powerful that their possessions began to take a back seat to everything else that was going on. Something so powerful was transpiring that, that what they owned and what they had didn't matter to them no more. 
Like, I want to experience that. I want to get to a place where nothing else matters but Jesus. They were at a place when nothing else mattered but Jesus. Verse 44 says that all the believers, they were together, and they had all things in common. And so this is a beautiful thing is because before they start giving all of their stuff away to meet the needs of the other, it says that they were together. And I always say there's always something that happens prior to something amazing happen. And what happened uh, 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 what was the fact that, that they were together. They were one body. This was before the church was divided. This was before multiple denominations came around. This was before there was so much division based off of this and based off of that. It says they were all together and they all had one thing in common. Ladies and gentlemen, we can get to be a church that has one thing in common, and that one thing in common is that I love Jesus, and, and I'll give everything, and I'll sacrifice everything for Jesus. I think it takes us to a different place. So the power of the Holy Spirit began to compel them to care for the other. And I'm not saying, ladies and gentlemen, that we're commanded to sell all of our stuff and distribute the proceeds but I'm also saying it's not a demonic idea. <laughs> and and let, let's just say in America, we, we, we love ourselves. We love our stuff. And the idea of selling our stuff and distributing the proceeds, it sounds demonic. But why is that? Well, let me just say that the American church, it aligns more with the values of America than it does the values of Jesus. Now, I'm not saying don't be patriotic and don't love your country, but what I am saying is patriotism and loving your country pales in comparison to loving Jesus. I, I, I'm saying my country pales in comparison to, to, to Jesus. And, and so, subsequently, their mode of giving uh, 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 in, in this first church, it is an act of obedience to love their neighbors as themselves. See, earlier... Jesus, he in, instructed them on the greatest command. He said, to love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. And then he says, which we think is an add-on, he says, love your neighbor as yourself. But what we see is this first church, they're fulfilling not only the great commission, they're fulfilling the great command to love their neighbor as their self. So, so I got all of my needs and I got everything that I could have ever imagined in my life and now, because I love my neighbor as myself, I worked hard, I went to college, I did this and I did that to make a good life for myself. Because I love myself, I'm going to give a little bit of what I got to my neighbor. This first church, they're fulfilling not only the Great Commission, they're fulfilling the Great Command, and so uh, their, their mode of giving, again, it's an act of obedience. And, and let me just say that we've taken giving in the church today, and we've Americanized it. Let me just say, because there's two prevailing giving gospels in America that places an emphasis on self. And I, you know, I, I, I don't want to rub nobody the wrong way, but I'm going to go there. One is on a desire to be and the other is on a desire to feel. And what, what do I mean? Well, you know, one is I, I want to be blessed. And certainly there is biblical precedence to say that it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. But I don't give specifically for the reason to be blessed. It's just a byproduct of my giving. I'm not doing it to be blessed. I'm doing it because I'm doing it out of obedience. Jesus says, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. And so what I'm doing, I'm doing it out of obedience and not because I want to be blessed. If I'm blessed, so be it. But then there's another gospel that we don't talk about too much, and that's the generosity gospel. I give because I want to feel generous. And let me just say, it's impossible to be generous with a God who is generous to you. Like, he owns everything. It's, it's, it's all of his. And so our giving is simply an act of obedience. And this is what's happening at this point in time. They gave simply as an act of obedience. Essentially, essentially their, their devotion to equity, it was more about their kingdom citizenship than it was about their national citizenship. 
There was needs among these 3,000 people. And let me tell you why there was needs among these 3,000 people. They, all, they were all pilgrims. They came from all over the world to be in Jerusalem for Pentecost. But then they made the decision, what just happened at this day of Pentecost, we ain't going home. We stand here. And so you got people who left their homes and their families, and they're now living in Jerusalem. And they don't got no money. They don't got no jobs. They don't got no house. They ain't got nothing. Well, essentially, ladies and gentlemen, what we're talking about is immigrants. So how did the first church deal with the immigrants that was among them, that was a part of their body? This was the response that we seen for the first church. The government didn't get involved. There was no need for that. The mayor, the king, none of that got involved. It was, it was a church. Church just figured it out on their own. And it says that there was none among them that had any need. None, none among them. And so not only did we see that the church devoted themselves to equity, the final uh, point that we're going to see in this passage is the church devoted themselves to one another. Let's pick up in verse 46. Look at what it says. It says, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Latin and Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Again, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. If you're following along in verse 46, let me bring to your attention attending the temple together and breaking bread. Praising, in verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. Uh, again, may the Lord add a blessing to the hearers and doers of his word. Now, now here we see a beautiful picture of what a community of believers should look like. As we see that it was, it was less about the church and it was more about the community of believers. It was less about the institution, and it was more about the community of believers. And, and the reason why this diverse community could devote themselves to equity and to one another is because they were doing life together. It's, it's something about doing life together. You see, it's hard to empathize with an ethnic community if you ain't doing life with people from a different ethnic community. They're doing life together. And, and, and verse 46, it re re reveals that they did life together. It says, day by day. Wasn't some time. It, it, it said it was, it was day by day. And, 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 and there was no calendar that was needed to schedule a time to get together. You know, sometimes we say, well, yeah, we're going to get together. Let's get something on the calendar. It said they, they, they were actually doing life together day by day. And I know our lives are a little bit different than maybe what it was then. But, but, but there was something about doing life together. It said they attended the temple together. It said they broke bread together. And they did all of this because they had one thing in common. Ladies and gentlemen, that one thing in common is Jesus. And to walk with Jesus, let me just say, it's a, it's a walk of consistency and not a walk of convenience. Luke, he made it very clear that this was day by day. Didn't take any breaks. It was, it, it, it was, it was a day by day walk. And I remember a, a friend of mine, he... He was a preaching dope dealer. Just like I said, he was a preaching dope dealer because one day he was a preacher and the next day he's a dope dealer. And then he mixed them, which was weird because, you know, he had a dope house and, and he had all the people that smoke dope smoking in his house. And when, after they get high, then he started preaching to them. I'm like, man, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? And I was getting ready to eliminate uh, this, this analogy out of my sermon this morning because I, I, I began to think about it. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe, maybe some good was coming out of this. As crazy as it sounds, because this man living a double life, and because he's living a double life, drug addicts got to hear about Jesus. But my whole point was, when I, when I say that we, we have to live a, 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 a life of consistency with Jesus, is that when things get, con when, when it gets convenient for us to, to live a different kind of way, we can't turn around and walk with, with convenience. But it's, it's a day-by-day -day walk. And it ain't, easy, it, ain't, it ain't easy to do the walk by yourself. That's why it's important that we have each other 
so we can walk together. So I can encourage you and you can encourage me. We're going to have some bad days. We're going to have some struggles. But, but it's important to have a body of believers to be able to walk together. Subsequently, the message that we preach on Sunday is to simply to challenge you to live out your faith on Monday and beyond. I don't want you just to leave here and you feel good. I want you to leave here and to be challenged on how I will live out my faith on Monday and beyond. I want you to begin to start thinking about your week right now. How will I live out my faith on Monday and beyond? And, 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 and as the first church lived out their faith, verse 47 says they were having favor with all the people. And this is a beautiful thing. In other words, the church is fulfilling John 13, 34, and 35. Look at what it says. It says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. You also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is what we see the first church doing. It says they're having favor with all the people. The reason why they're having faith with all the people is because all the people see the church loving one another. Ladies and gentlemen, when our city can begin to start seeing the church loving one another, not only, not only does it give us favor with the people, but obviously this church also has favor with God. Because the last thing that it says, it says, and he added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And let me just say this. He didn't add to the building, he didn't add to the church. You know, every, you know, sometimes we can get caught up like everybody want to have a big church, everybody want to be a pastor of a big church. I want people to come to ch my church. I want more and more people to come to my church so we can have multiple services and build big buildings and all those grand things. But that's not what Jesus was doing. He added to the kingdom. He added to the kingdom. And if we can get our focus on adding people to the kingdom and not to our church, God, whoever comes to these doors comes to these doors. Whoever don't, don't. I'm focused, and I want you to be focused on how many people are we adding to the kingdom. I can't do it by myself. Don't look at just me and Pastor Ronaldo. But I need some people who are with me that want to add some people to the kingdom. There's something down on the inside of you, and God is calling his people to start winning folks over toward the kingdom. And let me just say that there's no greater value that Jesus has added to my life than the value to be called the Son of God. Lord knows there was nothing that I did. I fell short. But... Here he is, he looks down off of his throne and he sees a people that's all screwed up, can't seem to get it right. And he'll come off his throne and suffer and endure a gaudy cross for somebody like me to have salvation, but also for somebody like you to have salvation. And now that we have it, ladies and gentlemen, my challenge to you is that you would take that responsibility and make sure that somebody else in the spaces and places that you occupy have an opportunity to meet Jesus. So would you be willing to invite them into your life so they can meet Jesus? And then you can bring them to church and meet me. <laughs> Let us pray. God, you are good. We love you. We thank you for your mercy, for your grace, your love, your kindness. God, we know that we can do nothing without you. God, we honor you for who you are, what you're doing, and what you continue to do. God, I thank you for each and every person that's here today. And God, I pray that we would all be challenged to walk according to the ways and wheels that you have instructed for us, God. Father, we pray right now for a devoted community that will be devoted to your teachings, that will be devoted to your will and your way. God, we love you and we thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.